uh, as always, uh, thank you so much for coming in today for our final FAIR dialogue for the 2020 project. Um, I know that all of you are quite busy, not just with the work outside of the project, but also with preparing for your final showcase, where each of you will be presenting your individual 12 minute talks on what you feel most passionately about to the rest of the world. We've got, a, as I said before, a very special guest with us today, whose mind all of you will have the opportunity to pick on for ideas, viewpoints, perspectives, prior to your individual presentations in November. Her experience has been extremely diverse, and in that she has a worldview that very few have the opportunity to cultivate. Right from Silicon Valley in the US to Slovenia to all of Europe, uh, there's a lot there that you will draw from as you have a conversation with her. Um, through all of these numerous different positions that she's held over the years, in one way or the other, her work has always focused on empowering individuals and taking actions that ensure collective betterment that focus on building communities together and improving the quality of life for all. Um, always taking the opportunity to contribute wherever she can. She has kindly agreed to set aside, as I said before, two hours of her time for us today, not just to present her views and her vision for our world, but also to provide her feedback to all of you wherever she can. So without much further ado, I'm extremely pleased to welcome our guest for today, Ms. Violeta Book, who has been the former Deputy Prime Minister of Slovenia and the former European Commissioner for Mobility and Transport. Beyond that, uh, as you will be able to tell when she, once she speaks with you, she is a visionary with ideas for our world that have the potential of, as what we keep talking about, rewinding the harm that we've caused to society and allow us to move forward with a plan, right? So thank you so much, Violetta, for agreeing to speak with us today. Um, to everyone else uh, on chat, to all the change makers, feel free to raise your hands well in advance so that once Violetta has spoken, then I can, I can come to you and then you can have a dialogue with her and move forward. And, and to those of you who may not have adequate bandwidth, type, type your questions up in chat and I'll be make sure to uh, put them across to her. So Violetta, all over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I cannot tell you how... Uh... Uh, thrilled and uh, curious I am how these two hours will go. Uh, I hope you all feel very privileged to be part of such an exciting project that all it wants to do is expand your minds. Uh, that is very rare to see. So my, all my compliments really uh, to the organizers, to, uh, to this brave visioner, vision of uh, Ramit. This is really, really special. So when I saw uh, your talk on TEDx, I said That's, that would be really uh, my honor uh, to be part of your initiative. So thank you again for giving me a chance. And uh, my dear colleagues, uh, young participants, uh, today's dialogue depends, uh, of course, a lot on me, but equally on you. So please do not hesitate uh, raising your questions, uh, even during uh, my hopefully short speech and then just engagement over your questions. Um, if you want to expand your mind and co-create the future of the society, you have to speak out and you have to speak up. So uh, make sure that you use that. Um, of course, uh, whenever you do it, do it with the uh, respect and, and uh, with, being, with the energy of being humble to the fact that you can actually do it. Uh, because many people take over uh, some ideas and then um, they feel that they own them, you know, ideas come because the moment is right, uh, because the congestion of consciousness around us is right. And if you are chosen to be the one who communicates that idea, that's a real privilege, but uh, we need to be extremely thankful to all that created the moment for us to see. Uh, so uh, I'm very much, I can say that at the beginning, an advocate that uh, knowledge should be universal good should be shared and not charged for. Uh, and um, I, hopefully throughout today's discussion, you will understand why. Uh, and as I said, if you really do look deeply into the whole development of knowledge, awareness, uh, consciousness, you will see that every single individual 
every mind contributes to it one way or the other. And the all Incas believe that. So they always had, uh, at least they got some good ideas going that um, they all were constantly trying to understand something new, some natural forces or um, understand the challenge and look for solutions. And they were very open in their discussion and communication because they knew that at one point one will get it and whoever will get it, that is the person who will teach everybody else. So uh, it was a truly open collaborative system. Unfortunately, only for an elite, but we still can learn from it and now make it broader in, in a sense of a global uh, awareness, global community, global knowledge sharing, because the challenges that are coming towards us are by far larger than any individuals, uh, any individual or any individual state, country, uh, organization. They are by far larger than small communities. Uh, as you can see today, we're facing planetary challenges that have to be dealt with on a local level. Just take climate change and uh, pollution, which are not two exactly the same things. Yes, we contributed to a faster shift in climate change, but climate change has been happening um, uh, on this planet Earth for the last couple of million years or since the existence of the planet Earth. But what uh, we need to be aware of that we are contributing to the uh, speed of changes beyond natural uh, capacity to adjust. Uh, because things that used to last maybe centuries or even uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of years are now done in a matter of one lifetime. So that is our worry. And uh, so of course you cannot address it only in India, you cannot address it only in Slovenia, you cannot address it only on one global corporation level, or even not only on the UN level, because it has to be part of every single one, every structure, every individual, every group. We need global cooperation and collaboration. And the worst thing we can do is hide information, hide the knowledge that has evolved based on the experience of all. That's one very important message to you. And the other one is, of course, if we take a look at the pollution itself, uh, that's purely our innovation. Uh, we've been doing really well. You know, our innovation really manifested well. We have to say that. Uh, but unfortunately, with uh, tremendous negative externalities. Uh, so uh, it is our duty and it's our privilege because cleaning the, our behavior, cleaning the planet Earth means cleaning our inner world. Means thinking differently, um, being truly connected with the natural forces, what we all the time are. At one point, we started talking about nature and people, nature and humans. I mean, for Christ's sake, uh, this is one. We are nature, not just something along the nature we are nature and as soon as we go against this loss of nature uh, of course it doesn't feel right deeply inside uh, so that's another invitation uh, that once we deal with pollution we will progress as individuals tremendously um, and of course the latest pandemic and COVID uh, is just another reminder how connected and intertwined everything on this planet Earth is. And uh, I can uh, sort of uh, make a statement which I would love to get your response to, is that currently the global connections and global intertwining is led by economy and trade. So all of a sudden through this COVID, became aware of this global connectedness because uh, we are all challenged by the situations that are happening on other continents. I'm sure India can feel the challenge of European Union. We feel the challenge of India and China and United States because all our businesses are very closely connected. So here we have a serious call from the nature to re-examine what are the values based on which we do this? 
what is the content of these trade mechanisms of these market-driven models? And uh, I will say it now and probably a few times later on that we have a unique opportunity now that uh, we start coming closer to the natural behavior and say, let's open the books, let's show the structures of value networks. Let's show how the distribution of margins is achieved and let's do it, let's share it fairly. Everybody should earn something because if one earns too much, there is somebody in this value network that will go out of business or uh, even something worse. And interesting enough, uh, Europe being the roughest imperialist in the past, these kind of models are emerging from Europe. Uh, started in Nordic, and uh, now it's moving down to the entire former Celtic world. And deeply inside, we feel that that is the right way to do. So uh, more and more, we hear voices and advocacy of transparency, of uh, taking on board just things that you really need, which means going openly against crematism, you know this word, which means there's an old Greek word, which means, you know, Uncle Scrooge, you remember that cartoon, where it keeps piling the money uh, and sitting on a pile of money without uh, ever using it because there, there is no way to use it because the money is not circulating and the value that is created through businesses um, is not coming back uh, with a new value and uh, co-creation of uh, sustainable uh, lifestyle. So all these questions are now out there on open and they are demanding answers. They are demanding our response. So I do believe that COVID will, uh, similar as plague in Europe in uh, between the 14th and 16th century, where um, thousands and thousands, they say even millions at that time, uh, died. But um, at the same time, a new level of consciousness was developed. And uh, soon after, French Revolution followed, and the feudal system was brought down to knees because the uh, poor people, the peasants realized that the nobles are equally uh, vulnerable as they were. They were dying of plague. They were not uh, appointed by God and protected by God, but they were just people. So all of a sudden this fresh new spirit was aw awakened and French revolution happened. Interesting enough to see uh, like a crisis from this kind of point of view. I do believe that COVID is uh, also asking us to, uh, to, to deal with our resources in a more responsible manner, to really use resources for what we actually need them for, um, and to be very cautious and cooperative in the way how we treat our planet Earth. So um, I am on a positive side, even though I know a lot of people suffer and we will continue to suffer you know, with all the restrictions we have, we went in a new complete lockdown also here in Slovenia. But um, it's, uh, I see that the lessons we will get will be so strong uh, that something very beautiful will emerge. Um, so a bit of introduction into something that uh, uh, follows, but uh, I just felt that I need to share this with you because you have to dare to challenge everything that is around you. You know, corgito um, ergo sum, I think that's why I am. So uh, that's a very powerful message that I use a lot. And you have a right to respectfully disagree with older generations, with the current situation, with the government, with the family, but respectfully, which means inviting everyone in a process uh, of uh, dialogue. And uh, uh, through that dialogue, if you're smart, you will always be able to get uh, a new common vision out, no matter how difficult the opponent in a dialogue is or person in a dialogue is. Uh, but with the uh, open mind, with the um, 
open hand, you will always be able to find a way forward where both of you will be enriched through the dialogue, whoever is on the other side. With that in mind, let me now switch this to, to the screen for a few uh, minutes. And uh, if anybody wants to comment, come on board, you're welcome. So if anybody wants to raise the hand and make any kind of comment based on my initial statements, I'm welcoming your participation. Please, on. Um. Anybody else does, I'm just gonna start. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't control myself. I know I should wait for the oh, Yeah, others. please, please, but, please. Uh, just, the, just what you said right at the end, right? Um, that if, if you are willing to have an open conversation, you will find a way to move forward, right? That's something that a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, are not recognizing in our world today. Because we it's just so sad that everyone thinks that there is either my way or your way, right? There can't be an our way, right? Yeah. That's the struggle. That's the struggle of how do we get more and more people to say that even if... You, they deep inside recognize that there is a middle ground. People don't want to budge from where they stand, right? Yeah. Um, and as what you know, what you said, one of the challenges that that I always keep thinking about is, you know, if someone's already made up their mind that they don't want to budge, right, and they're not even willing to listen to you, then how do you really get to a place where uh, you can move forward together because you're really looking at a, a solid wall in front of you? Well, I will hear. Uh... I, you know, I was not born with, uh, with this uh, comment that I'm going to make. Uh, life taught me. But um, life really proved, not only taught me, proved to me that everybody wants to be successful mm -hmm. and everybody wants to be recognized. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is really stubborn, there must be a reason. And usually look for this reason either in a lack of recognition or... Uh, in um, in just uh, lack of uh, being successful or perception of being successful in this interaction. So sometimes you have to make a step back and allow somebody uh, to uh, to to um, temporarily take over the conversation and allow that person to get everything out. I say just you know throw everything out that hurts inside and then look for the clues in the st statements one word uh, one gesture uh, on which you can base the next step i'll tell you an example i mean we have a bit of time so i can i can share an example i was sent years ago to one glass company which for slovenia was one of the biggest glass companies and it was absolutely the destiny of one valley because pretty much everyone worked for that company. And it was on the verge of bankruptcy. And, you know, um, I was young, I was a woman, uh, which did matter at the time. So they called me when nobody else wanted to take the case. So I said, okay, let me go in and see, because there was a long tradition and I just could not believe that they really started to perform so badly. So I came in with the, uh, like complete participatory model concept, engaging with everyone, bringing everybody on board. And uh, I had the backup of the, of the uh, management board. So it was, the, imagine this big room and I had inside around 60 people who worked in a steel company, hardcore workers from the production facilities, from the recipe, hot production, cold production, control, sales, everybody was in the room. And we were waiting for the chief of uh, recipe department. So um, he comes in and he says, look, you're stealing my time. Uh, I don't have time for that. All I tell you that in my department, everything is fine. And he left. Okay, we started our, but what I noticed is that he had a little ring in his ear, you know? Um, and I said, this guy cannot be so uptight because, you know, being a man, a tall man in a production facility and wearing an earring, that is a statement, right? 
So um, I did the first round of workshop. We started uh, mapping the pr uh, process or operational processes and everything. Next time I come, I prior to my next uh, session, I sent him all the results of our first session, asking him for an advice. I said, look, I know that everything is well for you, uh, in your department, but look, results are bad. So would you mind coming and assisting me in you know, identifying the problems in other departments? He said, yes. He became my, my most devoted supporter. And at the end, he became a director of the entire production facility. You know, I could have go, I could have really started to scream, complain to directors and everything, yeah. But I would lose the most valuable member of my team in the, for the future. So it was just a little earring that I saw in his ear that encouraged me to act differently. Yeah, and that's that's what we keep saying, right? You have to understand those who have those alternate views, who are on the other side, who are the ones that you're speaking with, and put them at the forefront. Then, right? Yeah. That's what you're saying. Is to my question, and, and now I now I think about how poorly my question was framed, because I said that how do we talk to uh, those who are not willing to listen? Uh, and the answer you've given is that uh, no, you need to observe and listen. Talking, you let them talk. Yeah, you let them talk and you find, you will always find an opening. Yeah, yeah. Shawani, you've got something to say. I, I can see your hand raised. Yeah. Uh, can, am I audible? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, glad to have you here. And what I wanted to ask you was, and of course, I feel like you would have a really unique perspective on this, is that... Um, I'm sorry, but I cannot hear uh, the lady. Yes, network network issues, unfortunately. Shivani, would you want to type that out for us? Uh, uh, sure, I'll do that. Perfect. Oh, I see your hand raised as well. Uh, why don't you come in till the time we get Shivani's question in? Yes. Hello, ma'am. So I'm really inspired by your talk. And to understand that, uh, you know, the European Union and its, part, its countries, they are moving towards, in the, they are moving in the opposite direction of imp imperialism is really great. And they are actually decolonizing the population, as you said, the Nordic countries, it starts from there and then it's going down further. But at the same time, uh, there is a violent reaction from the, you know, the extremist on the other side, fueled mm. by the capitalist and their friends. So we see what's happening, what happened in UK with Brexit, and then there is Hungary, then there is Poland, and then there is Belarus and these countries. So how do we make sure that you know, our civil movements, they don't get hampered and by, by these capitalist, uh, you know, powers. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, thank you, Om. Um, I would not uh, use the word capitalist as a bad word uh, because uh, not all capital practices that are part of the capitalist system are really that bad. Uh, we're talking so, uh, about so-called moral capitalism that is emerging because we have not came out uh, up with a new uh, concept of a society, not yet, that could be greater than socialism and capitalism and everything we experienced so far. So we are now searching within the existing model a bit of improvement and uh, what is emerging is the so-called moral capitalism, which is of course clashing uh, with the uh, old establishments. What is happening in US, for example, is a really good example. So uh, we should not be uh, discouraged with extreme reactions because they always happen where those groups are threatened. In a, a grassroots uh, area that all this establishment started to feel really threatened and they're pushing back badly. So um, I'm not gonna try to be too smart on this one, but the way how I deal with conflicts is that uh, I don't, I try not to engage, but create a different world uh, and start creating a strong positive uh, vibe in, in, in a parallel world that starts pulling in more and more uh, people, engagements, 
uh, and makes the old world weaker. Because if you fight, uh, you know that in any fight, there is no winners. There is never any winner in a war. You know, everybody loses. So uh, I don't approve conflicts. Yes, in an extreme situation, they will always happen. But um, uh, personally, I try to create uh, space where different types of philosophy can be exercised, different types of attitude, different types of relationships. So far, it's been working well. I will share some of those with you. Uh, but don't get uh, discouraged by those that exercise the power, which means because they mean it means just that they feel threatened. I encourage you to 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 continue to awaken uh, the positive vibe within yourself, because on your in your inner world, and those that are familiar with the laws of quantum physics will uh, soon recognize this. In our inner world, we always know what's right. Yeah, only through different cultural barriers or experiences from our uh, social life, family life, business life, uh, they started to block what our clean vibration is telling us. And that's been proven on a quantum level, you know, the concept of the observer. Yeah, uh, quantum systems always know what's right. So they started to use them now for the most sophisticated security systems, even though we do not understand why it's so. Yeah, but they always know if you like if you do a quantum experiment and you put a camera that is um, taping the experiment, there will be a different beam on the wall than when you switch the camera off. And then if you try to pretend, you move the camera away and it's different beam, and then you bring camera back and you don't switch it on, the system will know on the quantum level, they will know that you're not taping. So the beam will be the same as when the camera is not present. It's a, it's a great experiment. You can see it on the web. It's typed, it, I mean, um, taped in many different forms. And deeply inside, we always know what is right. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think, uh, and that's the core, right? Uh, instead of the conflict, you focus on what is other than the conflict, right? And then that becomes a priority. And then it just becomes so much easier than to even have conversations around the conflict. So Penny sent in her question, uh, Violetta. I'm just going to read it out, paraphrase it slightly. Uh, her concern has, has been, and I, I know this because I've spoken to her earlier as well about yeah. things like that, uh, Invariably, governments uh, do not necessarily understand the ground level uh, changes that are required and the policy changes that uh, those at the ground levels actually get impacted by, right? Uh, how do we really ensure, how, do, how does civil society, how do individuals really ensure that the things that matter uh, go from a bottom up sort of an approach towards the government and then becomes more, uh, relevant for them to really take care of and to, and to do something about than the top-down kind of an approach that we have right now where governments across the, the world may perhaps not even understand the ground level concerns and issues of their uh, people. Well, that's, it's not an easy uh, question, but it's a good one. Thank you. Um, it's really easy to blame the government for everything. Uh, and at the same time, when I say that, I would also say that the governments reflect the level of awareness and consciousness of the nation. So if you want to change your government, you have to change yourself. So go and act. That's all I can say. I mean, I was part, I was an entrepreneur for 14 years, just to inspire you, okay? Uh, not to revolution, but to evolution. Uh, I, uh, I was running my own company. I was. I was really happy with the way how everything was going. Uh, but then at one point I'm realizing that the government we had at that time had one failed project after the other. And they were using my taxes that I was paying faithfully for these failed projects. And I think I act, I find a way to engage. Yeah. Um, so I started to look for people who shared my ideas and soon we were a nice group and our intention was to create a shadow government and to have a professional opinion about everything that the government does. And we were really a very diversified group, um, about, at the end about 20 people from all different professions. 
And we were just meeting weekly and discussing what uh, the government is doing and start just started to send soft messages out. Well, our government stepped down, not because of us, but <laughs> because of some other conditions. And <coughs> our friend said, well, you should go. You should go and be part of the elections. Uh, we didn't have a party, anything. So five weeks before the elections, we, create a par we created a party. We went on elections. We won 36% of the votes, the highest uh, amount of uh, votes any party ever got in Slovenia. And we were then in charge of putting the government together, which we did. And that's how I ended up being a Euro European Commissioner for Mobility and Transport. Um, it's it all happened in seven weeks. Wow. Five weeks before the elections, elections we won. I was uh, for uh, two weeks a minister, not a few more. Then I became a deputy prime minister, and a week later I became a European commissioner. I mean, how? Yeah, but. When the time is right, and if you are ready and you are available and you sincerely uh, are doing things that you believe are right, it's really amazing what life provides. I cannot say anything else because I was not really creating this. I didn't ask for, I didn't want to be a minister, but we didn't have anybody else because nobody wanted to join us in a team because they thought we were going to last only a couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, so I became a minister. I didn't ask to become deputy prime minister, but somebody from our party had to be and had to be a woman because other two deputies were already men. Yeah, I didn't never dream to be a European commissioner, but our candidate was rejected by the European Parliament. Either was or is at least deputy prime minister or prime minister, and I was the only one who qualified. I mean, I was happy to do the job, but I never planned to do that, but I wanted to create a change. Are you with me? Yeah. That's a, the message I wanna give it to you. And you might not end up as the prime ministers of India, but if you do things from your heart and things that you really believe, you feel it inside that you have to do, don't hesitate. Your what, what I'm taking from that, Violetta, is that uh, it all started with not necessarily a political intent, right? No, not and, at all. And you were successful in that outside of the government as well. You actually, it, it turned into a success, was success what you what you sought out to do. And if the result of that was, of course, you getting 36% of the votes, the highest ever, and so on and so yeah. forth, it's still all part of the bigger picture that you were seeing, right? And then it just became part of the journey, not necessarily the end in itself, right? Exactly. Which, is, which is what we need to remember, is that if there's something that we're passionate about, something that we want to make a difference for, and as what you said very rightly, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to blame governments, right? Um, yeah. I think it's important to be critical of them, that I always maintain. It's extremely important to be critical of yes, them. Yes, absolutely. Um, at the same time, recognizing the fact that if there's something that you think is amiss, uh, the only person who will actually do something about it is you because you know what's going on inside your mind. So you have to, as what you said, act, take action. Um, and connect with people who share your thoughts. But uh, there is another hidden message in it because uh, if I look back into my life, there were so many almost strange things that happened to me and things that I had to learn, that I had an opportunity to learn or get engaged. Even my move to United States for five years, I was in Silicon Valley. I mean, I never asked for that, but opportunity presented itself. And I said, okay. Uh, but when I look back, I was already getting ready for that because I uh, paid myself a month of uh, English course in Cambridge um, because my English was weak at the time. Not that right now it's really that good, but. Uh, it was much worse, believe me. And, and I didn't know why that call was inside me. But half a year later, I realized that if I didn't take that course, I would not be able to pass the exams for the University of the United States, and I would never get a job in Silicon Valley. You know, it's like things, life provides us with opportunities, and we just, even sometimes they think they seem irrational. If you feel inside that they're right, go for them. 
because you never know what comes next. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, Jasjeet, you've got your hand raised for a while. Um, um, hi, am I audible? Yes. Um, hi. So, hi, ma'am. So, I just have one small question. Um, so, of course, when we talk about climate change, we have seen a lot of activists that have come up, and particularly activists that are um, 16 years, 17 year olds, um, people like Greta Thunberg, and there are now people coming up in India as well. Um, so, th that's one side to the story. But on the contrary, you look at uh, certain heads of states that very clearly say that do not still acknowledge that global warming is still an issue or they do not give it the importance that they should be giving it. Um, so as someone who's, you know, formally served um, in a position of uh, the government, how tough does it make your negotiations with other countries on certain agreements or on certain policies when it comes to critical issues like these? Well, this is one of the proofs that our society evolved because uh, we, as I mentioned before, we're becoming more and more aware of this global connectivity with these global intertwining relationships. So uh, we started in the past, started to create multilateral environments where we can meet and negotiate. This is something, for example, that the American president, current president is very much against because they, this kind of multilateral negotiations, uh, they don't allow uh, too many manipulations and uh, uh, doing favorites, <clears throat> but uh, it, it is in an open field because many participate. I was part of many uh, multilateral global negotiations, especially for aviation and, and maritime, for example, for climate change negotiations. Uh, and. Uh, I think this we will see more and more of that. Uh, currently, I'm so happy that nobody else joined uh, United States in their attempts to, to destroy multilateral uh, polygons or even organizations like WHO, for example, as soon as US exited, China entered it. So um, it gave it the strength back because even China realized that uh, they are not strong enough to, to stand on their own. They have to negotiate. Yeah? For example, I was negotiating with them on a, on a Silk Road uh, connection between uh, European continent and, 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 and Asia. And it was really hard at the beginning, but uh, and it took a long time to develop trust, uh, constantly proving that there is no hidden agenda, no imperialistic attentions. And of course, I needed the same guarantee back from their side. Uh, but then we found common ground, started to do a joint analysis um, and started to learn how to trust each other. And it takes a long time before you develop this trust, especially if you have a bad history or some sort of uh, unclear his, uh, historical moments. But uh, if you're coming to uh, attention and sincere wish to, to deliver something good, uh, there is always a way forward, like European and Japan trade deal is a good example of that. You know, every, all odds were against us, uh, but because there was a real sincere commitment, not only to trade deals, but also the clean agenda, we had a common uh, sort of a shared vision that we want to send a message that green is a serious political topic. So we got this deal done. And it's fantastic deal for both countries. I mean, for European Union and for Japan. Um, so I'm not sure if I uh, answered your question operationally enough, but basically multilateral, first you need to create a space for this multilateral uh, negotiations take place. Uh, and it's physical space, it's logical space, uh, rules that you have to agree. And this is something that EU is now very firmly standing for. It's a rule-based negotiations. It's a rule-based multilateral agreements. Um, and these are rules that are transparent and need to, be, need to be agreed first. And then based on those rules, you engage. Is that something you were asking? I'm not sure. Um, yes, ma'am. Thanks. Okay, um, Rishika, you've got your hand raised for a while as well. Yeah. Hi, ma'am. Thank you so much for Hello. 
joining us today so uh, this is a little off topic from what you were just talking on right now but i have been extremely fascinated by your zoom background so i just wanted to understand from you what is that all about the background picture that you have for your uh, zoom video right now my background yeah Yep. I'm electrical engineer by profession. Um, uh, computer science, I got master's in information systems. I did an MBA, president's MBA, uh, just to acquire business knowledge. That's my scientific background. I was all my life um, a sport person, a competitive sport person to learn that competitiveness is not the right model. But I was in Yugoslavian basketball team, I was a Slovenian champion, Javelin and all kinds of stuff. Whatever I competed in, uh, I did really well, but uh, that taught me that the competition models are not good. And I do not believe in the competition model, even in business, uh, because uh, whenever you compete, you always try to adjust your creative thinking and your, uh, the vision of the world uh, to somebody else's vision because you try to be better than them in a certain either market segment or in a certain technological development, but that by itself, by definition. So I believe in a concept of blue ocean strategy. If you've heard for that, about that, if not, I recommend you. It's a bit older book, but it's a fantastic in a sense of explaining why competition model is destructive force. And they call it a red ocean because the blood is always there you know everybody suffers or a blue ocean where based on who you are based on your competences look for market segments um, that uh, appreciate who you are uh, and are willing to trust you that you will address their genuine needs it's this relationship between who you are and genuine needs of the market uh, that you can provide the solutions for try it. I, all my life I've been doing that. I was, I can claim now that I was a successful businesswoman and, and entrepreneur. Um, and I always follow this. Uh, it's, uh, it works. It really works. Yeah, no, but I, I think a lot of us agree to agree to that in that sense, because that's what we've all been um, trying to work towards and trying to trying to think for ourselves as well. So, so uh, and maybe just additional comment, because it is since I need to complete the circle. Once yeah. I moved away from that, I really uh, understood much better the, the nature of spirituality and spiritual dimensions. Um, so I got my black belt in Taekwondo and Hapkido just to understand the basics, the flow of energy, which was, it's, it's not that common uh, to Western culture. But I knew that there is more than just physical appearance of everything. So that really gave me an incredible uh, insight into uh, the flow of uh, chi and this relationship between energies um, and uh, uh, among people, which is uh, relationships are based on this flow of these energies. So that's another um, strong tool that helped me uh, to engage in these difficult dialogues, because I knew that I have to find a way how to move the chi. <laughs> um, and then I also became curious how uh, all tribes really uh, manage to deal with their competences. We read about all kinds of stories. Uh, but uh, what is common to the old stories, no matter which continent they come from, is that they always were looking for the competences that people were born with. Yeah, so they sent boys to the quest in the forest. They uh, they listened to the uh, to the baby in a womb and telling the story why she or he's coming to this world, like the Kari people in Africa. Um, and I'm sure in India, you have a lot of stories like that. So that's why I got involved in a shamanic academy, which I also passed, uh, not to become a shaman, because you cannot become a shaman. Uh, you can also, this has to be also your calling. And it was not my calling, but uh, that was yet another dimension into human, emotional, spiritual, and energy levels. Um, and uh, I got in touch with incredible tools storytelling 
which is a really powerful tool to, to, to bring communities together. Um, so I like telling stories, as you can tell. Uh, but um, uh, not only for that, you could have, this is, can be a very uh, strong motivating tool when you have the workshops uh, and you can connect people through storytelling, through uh, the engagement on, on, on a, a really an energy level, not only rational. So all this kind of started to come together. Uh, and uh, I'm really happy that I was brave enough to enter the worlds that I had no clue about and I had no uh, idea uh, how I'm gonna get, get out of that on how or who will I be when I come out of this process. But uh, because the calling was there, I said, okay, let's trust life and let's go. And you were willing to take the steps. That's the important bit, right? A lot of people don't take those steps forward because they don't, uh, they don't like to step into the unknown. And that's what we keep hearing as well, right? Uh, but yeah. you took the steps and, uh, and that's, that's the, your, your life is a result of the steps that you took. Um, I know that you want to talk to us about your vision for the world as well and the presentation you'd had up. Uh, so it should we, because Inayat has had, had a hand raised for a while, so maybe we can take that and then we can get to that because I do know you want to share that with, with all of us also. Okay, sure, thank you. Okay, let's go then. Let's go back to the presentation then. Yeah. So can we take one more question before we, we get there? Because we, we, yes, we have, yeah, so Inayat, you've got your hand raised for a while. So let's just do your yeah, question. Yeah, please, of course. Yeah, so let's do your question and then we'll get to the presentation. Inayat. Uh, so my question is in continuation with what uh, Ma'am was talking. Uh, and uh, basically she was talking about the competition and how it takes away individuality. Uh, but the thought that came to my mind is that uh, aren't like the focus in the world, and I think especially in India, because that is where we've seen it a lot, is happening on monitoring and surveillance systems, which are based on certain goals uh, that certain section of the society think that just taking care of those goals makes uh, the system better. So um, what do you think, I just wanted to ask, what is your take on these monitoring systems, which in a way might take away that individuality um, by creating that sense of competition? Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much for this question too. It's, it's a bit tricky one, uh, but uh, let me be very frank. I don't see any problem with the goal-based um, projects. I don't see a problem uh, with the governance models, but, um, and I, I would dare to uh, speculate that there is, uh, you don't need competitiveness in order to follow your goals. I mean, uh, I have my own goals. Uh, primarily, I have now mission more than goals. But uh, when you have a, a group of people, uh, somehow you need to establish shared values, shared vision, and possibly at least the major couple of goals that you can reflect the, the journey that, that you are going through together uh, and, co uh, and compare them to, uh, with goals that you want to achieve along the way. So uh, competition or no competition, uh, goals can serve you as a tool. And governance model doesn't need competitive model in order to be useful. It, uh, governance model just uh, establish different points in, a, in a, uh, either in an ecosystem, in, in an organization, or on a journey against which you compare uh, your achievements. Uh, and you can always change them. You have to be ready to change the goals too. They are not something like static uh, because the world around you is changing all the time. Uh, that's why we try to go back and, and talk about values and mission statements saying, if uh, I'm still contributing to the society, something good. If I still feel that I'm within my value system, uh, goals can be readjusted. Understood. Thank you, Violetta. Um, presentation time then. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I hope this will, yeah. Uh, we already talked about me, so we can skip that. Uh, we can skip that. Okay. Uh, this, this slide I prepared with a very uh, clear idea in mind. It shows 
pretty much all major projects that I worked on, but more instead of talking about the projects themselves, I wanted to make a point here that um, uh, some sort of bigger paradigms, they usually consist of a lot of small steps. So don't push yourself too hard that you have to make huge steps in order to, uh, to, to make it in life. Um, they were, even while we were talking, if some uh, of the elements of the life that I shared with you, my life seem maybe uh, big, but they were really just a consequence of yet another small step. You know, so um, one of my first sort of bigger learnings and also very um, self-rewarding projects were so-called Inco movement, uh, which I started, uh, I think it was in 2006, I started to think about it um, because I realized that in order to, to contribute to the society, what I knew how to do best, which was innovating, innovation, change, new things, uh, empowering people with the new uh, uh, engaging uh, goals or future opportunities. I needed to get some sort of space in Slovenian society. At that time, nobody wanted to talk about innovation. So I created a movement and over the course of six years, about 6,000 people got involved. If I tell you that the population of Slovenia is 2 million, that's not too bad. Um, 6,000 people that were actually active and we started to come together with different uh, projects uh, and everything was open. We shared everything. This is where I tested this concept of uh, sharing and capitalizing then through the products, through the services on the market, a, this shared information. Um, it wasn't easy at the beginning because many people were afraid of sharing, but after a while they realized they gained so much from the collective that they were able to and willing to participate fully with their knowledge. Uh, so we had no money for this project that I think it's important to say the only financial uh, expense was uh, sometimes we had to rent rooms and this is where my company then would appear as a sponsor or we had to pay for some tea and cookies uh, when we had the smaller groups and meetings but everything else was done on a volunteering basis uh, through participation of people who were uh, interested and in most of the time, we didn't have classical conferences, meaning whoever came was already an active actor of, uh, of the event. Um, so we learned so much. And I shared, if you go to my page on uh, eco-civilization, which you will you have the address at the end, you will see this book. Uh, we published a book then about manifest in, uh, innovation, journalism, and innovation communication. Uh, because I, we really wanted to share with everyone the experiences we went through and the power of uh, collective engagement um, and uh, sharing of knowledge. So with that, uh, we then enter even into a broader uh, engagement on a global scale, uh, which is the next book, which is The Magic of Contribution, where we show how we engage in the entire global community. Um, my activities brought me to the advisory board at Stanford University for, um, for this uh, area, innovation communication, uh, for, where I was um, for five years. And again, we co-created something from scratch. Uh, before we started to engage, there was no hit on internet on innovation journalism. Now, when you Google it, you will find uh, millions of hits. Um, and this again showed me, this was a very valuable experience uh, that I could see that in five years time, you can create so much on a global scale. So from that point on, I was not afraid of engaging on anything globally, because if you can do in five years time, such a big uh, thing, um, then anything is possible, right? Um, and uh, you can see all projects inside and uh, don't copy but allow to be inspired because some projects that people did are really inspiring <laughs> on a local community level, on a global level. Um, 
it, it just amazes me how much you can do when uh, you feel the right call, really. Um, out of that, many new business models emerge, like the model of intuition. We brought, uh, we really broke through uh, this um, negative connotation of mentioning intuition in business. So with this little model of systemic decision-making where intuition plays an important role, um, after a few years, everybody started to talk about intuition in business and nobody uh, really knew where that came from. And that for me is the biggest success. You know, I don't need acknowledgement. I just want to see that uh, some good ideas became sort of a public good, you know? Uh, that is the excitement because that means that uh, the space has been created where a new idea even more uh, advanced can emerge. Uh, and all kinds of different dimensions. Um, prior to that, uh, just before I entered into this movement, this uh, sort of understanding uh, that businesses are going through similar evolutionary processes as we humans are going, as the nature altogether is going. And once you acknowledge them, then you can uh, really understand how to help uh, organizations to, to, to move on. For example, this is how this model, which was also well recognized and awarded in Slovenia, but uh, model of business evolution came to place where, um, what I realized is I came in the company they, and I realized that they invested in some tools or business consultancies that came from uh, different cultural frameworks, let's put it this way. Um, and they, people were really enthusiastic. They paid huge money for it. And in about a year, everything disappeared. Even though there were millions of euros behind it. And I said, how, why? And then I started to observe companies and real, I realized that they are not all companies are always ready for all tools. Yeah. And then I real started to look what is the essence of their value creation? What are their value systems? Um, how do they acknowledge? Uh, 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 how do they acquire knowledge? And that's how this business evolution model came uh, through, where we had working environments, learning environments, thinking environments, and self-aware uh, aware environments. And the first one was driven by productivity. So it was a completely different organizational structure, value sets, because all they were focusing is on productivity, meaning new technology all the time, uh, maximization of business uh, units, and that was it. But of course, Slovenia, I cannot survive a long time with that only. Uh, because we're too small, we are, our social uh, system is too expensive, so you have to move on. So the next type of companies were learning environments where they already based uh, everything on a system of constant improvement and uh, knowledge became a value. So they started to flatten organizations <coughs> and uh, started to empower more people that they could get innovation going on a process level. Um, but soon you, and this is again a very specific mindset uh, where uh, the boss still tells you do as you're told, but tell me if, uh, if you see some mistakes that we can uh, correct or do if you have an idea in order to improve the process itself. Um, not too many companies with that attitude these days in Slovenia can survive. So Slovenian companies had to move forward because that was not enough anymore in order to be able to understand the development of markets. So we moved into the so-called thinking environments where uh, innovation started to drive the type of knowledge that the companies acquire and the type of productivity models and technology that the companies um, deploy. Are you with me? So now depends on which, and then the third one is self-conscious environment where you don't have organizational structures anymore, but you have some sort of pools of people and you see this in IT. Many often IT companies are engaging in this kind of business modeling now. Uh, when you have a problem, you put together the group of expertise that can uh, address this problem or a new business opportunity. Uh, and then uh, you let them work on it. Once they are done, you, restructure the teams again. So you don't have uh, organizational static structures anymore. Everything is dynamic. And it's uh, you're looking for problems and opportunities 
um, and engage over uh, delivery of them. We see this in IT more and more often uh, to be uh, the case. Uh, and most of the companies who are successful in Slovenia are now in the process of entering thinking environments. So now you understand that uh, different management tools, different, uh, different uh, HR uh, uh, concept, different uh, productivity concepts are uh, suitable for different types of companies, depends on which evolutionary phase they're in. I invite you to think about it. You could take a look at the book. It's in English. It's all free. Whatever I create, I all share uh, because um, life provides me with other means to make money. Uh, so knowledge is, uh, I, I share knowledge. So maybe you get inspired. Maybe you will recognize your own challenges or challenges of your clients in, 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 in this concept. Um, so, but all this was the accumulation of experiences and knowledge that brought me to the point that this year, all of a sudden, I felt a call that there is a, a concentration of energy in the air and the challenges that we're facing with, that it's calling for more than just improvement, more than just a uh, business innovation, more than just a social innovation. Uh, maybe there is a time to really rethink our civilizational paradigm. And this is when the concept of eco-civilization started to emerge. Um, it was driven really by the thought that if we want to find answers to the most pressing matters, some of them we already mentioned, pollution, pandemics, uh, the uh, exhaustion of our planet, we need to start coming together in a much broader scale and start imagining. Imagining the world that we want to live, not just improving the world that we are not happy with. Are you with me? Why would you constantly try to improve the world that we all feel very uncomfortable with? So let's try to go beyond. Let's try to imagine the world that we would like to live in and then transform the existing one, not to destroy, but just transform, use the power of transformation to, 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 to lead to something fresh and new. And um, as John Lennon said, you still know who John Lennon is? The youth, maybe. I'm he was sure. a big a popular singer of Beatles and then he had his own career. But he said, if I dream on, by myself, I dream. If I dream with others, I create. Yeah, and there is always First, a thought, always. And thought is the most powerful tool you can ever imagine, and it's for free. It's a thought. And then from the thought, you go further and try to manifest and see if the thought has also manifestation uh, future. Uh, so when this thought started to come, yeah, and it really just, it was a spare of the moment. Um, but based on everything we shared already in our dialogue, and you know so much now about um, all the work that's been done behind. Then this thought started to ask for uh, shared goals or vision at least, which started to get the name eco-civilization. Um, and of course, uh, for ways to start imagining together. And uh, this why became how. Uh, I started to ask, I just draw on with my hand one model of that came through one night in my mind. Uh, and of course, I'm grateful to every single person I ever met in my life and contributed to who I am today because that is their result as well. And I just published it. It was really quite surprising, very surprising, positive, a lot of comments uh, and, and, and responses. Uh, so uh, we started to conduct different discussions, webinars, like we have it today. And that started in April 
and we, it, we, it's still going on every month and you're welcome to join. They're free of charge, uh, they're open. Uh, you can come and co-create idea. For example, we were discussing how, what will be the role of new technology in eco-civilization. When I'm claiming that in new eco-civilization, technology will no longer play as essential role as is playing in this civilization. Uh, I'm uh, inviting you to take a look at the, again, this new, uh, uh, evolving laws of physics that we are starting to understand. And I do believe the relationship on its most particle level and on a day to day uh, level among people will play the essential role. We will understand the concept and the importance of relationship in a new way. So this will be the primary driver of change and the, the, uh, the, the value creation uh, for the new eco-civilization. This is just my hypothesis, of course. You're happy to challenge it uh, by all means, yeah? But it's just something I'm throwing at you uh, and hopefully uh, it will trigger you enough that you will put some thoughts into it. Um, and more I was thinking about it, more I was downloading for who knows where, collective consciousness, Akashi, whatever you call it. But, um, and some of the models I will share today, but the rest, if you're interested, you can go and see them on a the page. They are all uh, on the eco civilization page. Uh, and all of a sudden, we get these core goals emerging Earth as an eco zone of our galaxy, of the universe, uh, popula population of other planets based on the sustainable strategies and uh, circular economy. Uh, discovery of new law of physics. And what it will became obvious is that the new civilizational paradigm will for the first time in the known history of humankind emerge from global awareness and consciousness and not from the continental. And uh, that's what all this green agenda and commitment to, to, to understand the planet um, better and to see that we all share the same uh, the same home, uh, this will probably be the basic vibe for driving this, uh, this uh, change. Uh, I started to pay attention to things that people were communicating and uh, this list keeps going, uh, keeps expanding. There are these contradictions in the society, sort of a, um, uh, how would I say, like thesis and antithesis type of relationships, like from move from ego to eco civilization, from breakdown to breakthrough, from competition to collaboration, from capital growth uh, based on the outside interventions to organic growth based on the inner strength, from hierarchy to networks, from profits to shared value, from cremation to care, from functions to entities, um, from static structures to dynamic networks and so on and so on. I don't wanna read them all, but uh, if anyone is uh, disturbed or provoked by any of this and wants to raise the question and discuss it, you're more than welcome. But these are the, now the energies and the, 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 the content that is making the concept of evolutionary paradigm more and more tangible. And uh, that's the model that emerged. Uh, one of the challenges that I was facing with also as a commissioner, European commissioner was that I realized that we try to defend and try to protect the tools instead of humanity. What do I mean by that? There, is, there was a big shakeup on the stock exchange and everybody was worried about stock exchange. How can we stabilize it? What can we do in order to pre prevent the, the financial system from collapsing and things like that? Um, we were worried about um, educational system. Oh, educational system is uh, uh, you know, not uh, serving us well. We have to add new computers. We have to improve the buildings. Do you feel that something wrong with that? These are all tools health system, education system, economical models, financial models, stock exchange, uh, that's buildings, that's all tools. 
for us to live better. So instead of focusing on tools, I'm inviting in the concept of eco-civilization to focus on what life is all about. Beings, human, animals, plants, bacteria, blobs, uh, even viruses, if you want. On society, the way how all these different beings come together, the structures that we create in order to engage together and coexist. Land, you know, on which we stand and we feed from and we, uh, you know, we cannot exist without the land. Consciousness, which is collective wisdom. And now imagine that and relationships that bring everything together and put everything in a dynamic evolutionary spiral uh, process. And now imagine that municipalities, governments, companies are organized like that. Instead of having department for HR, you have beings, you have society, you have land, you have uh, wisdom. And then you think, how can I develop that? How can I improve that? What do I need to do for humans to uh, uh, develop more holistically? Not to defend the existing education system, but put education system in a, a content of relationship, which means that they are constantly dynamically readjusting to needs. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the world where we focus on uh, these elements and we everything that has a connotation of a tool, we put into dynamic uh, state, which is an element of relationship. Because um, then we can think about holistic development. Are you still with me? Have I lost you? Right here. Okay, this is the, and now of course in our work, now we zoom on every one of these elements. Uh, I, I'm not planning to go through that because I think uh, even if we engage a little bit now on this level, we can have a good conversation going, but if you're interested, as I said, in more in depth uh, about how this concept will evolve, you can follow us on website, on all social media, or even join us on our discussions. But let me ask you now at this point, how does this sound? Is it, can you relate to that? It, does it sound something that uh, uh, you could put some thoughts into it or is it too bizarre and don't be afraid to say so because I am a big girl, I can take it. Yeah, oh, please. Um, this sounds absolutely <laughs> revolutionary, but at the same time, it's very much uh, in, in uh, it's, it's, I don't know, I don't really have the words to say this, but it comes down to the point that all of us, we are same, we all have, you know, we all are made up of the same things. And therefore, there should be that sort of network between us and these blocks that we build around ourselves, uh, around our, you know, true self, these should be sort of uh, cut down that this is, this is what I understand. And, and this is truly revolutionary because, you know, we, like you said, we keep on thinking about the tools, but we don't really think about, you know, the problem itself in, in that life. sense, I life. <laughs> life. Mom, I can. Now, when I'm inviting you all, not only you, all, but thank you for this comment is go out and test it. And if people will look at you strangely, just, you know, say European commissioner was talking about that. So blame me. Uh, and uh, so feel free to, to speak about this, to speak in this language. And India is so rich with, with, uh, with knowledge about that. And uh, somehow you're not getting through. You know, I, I mean, many of these things I could uh, relate also to, to, to some uh, Veda uh, sayings uh, from Indian culture. That's why I'm, I'm, you will recognize some things and I don't know where all this obligation came from because I just 
was able to read and get in touch with so many incredible people that I cannot put the note of everything that I learned from others, yeah? So that's why this is collective. Anybody else? Um, you had something to follow up as well, are you right? Or are you good? Well, yes. so... Yeah? No, no, go ahead. So it, it was just about the same thing that ma'am, you talked a lot about the consciousness and, uh, you know, how subconsciously we all know that we all are part of this nature, but it's just that it, because of the economic needs or because we have to survive by making money, mm. the, it, it comes in our way. So how do we dissolve this sort of conflict that although I know deep within inside that I'm part of this nature and, and I'm still not able to act upon it because of, you know, I have to survive in this world. So how do I, I mean, how do we uh, overcome this issue? Just a little step at a time. I don't know. Uh, if we take a look at the circular economy model, yeah? Circular economy model consists of many elements, but the most important is to redesign. So whenever you have an opportunity to either design a new product, design a new service, design a new building, this, be part of the design a new road, always put circular economy first. So a circular concepts first. So think about how you're gonna, whatever you're gonna use, put into the two loops, either, uh, recy either um, decomposition uh, loop or the recycle loop of the material back to the uh, to the raw material. So these are the two loops of circular economy. Yeah? Either everything decomposes back into the soil or it is reused as a raw material for new production. Yeah? So, uh, but even this might be too big. Uh, let's go back and say uh, redesign is really where the biggest impact happened, but you already need to be in a position. Yeah? You need to have a job, you need to be in charge. But don't forget about that. It's gonna happen sooner than you think. I mean, a couple of years uh, time, you will be responsible for big projects. Um, the second thing that you could always do is reuse. Rethink how you can reuse different material or even uh, clothes or old furniture. Or uh, like when I was remodeling the house, I saved all the old material and I reused it later on uh, for, many very, very cool things. And I like having now these old things in different corners uh, of my property because they, they remind me of uh, the history. Yeah, I didn't throw them away, like old tiles or old wood. Um, uh, these are the two most commonly uh, used uh, old materials. Then, uh, this is reuse, then it's reduce. Oh, that was, that's hard. I mean, I, I suffered a lot of time, you know, uh, because uh, my whole life I was born in socialism, hardcore socialism, and then little by little Yugoslavia started to evolve and Slovenia was really doing well. So my whole life is an improvement of everything, yeah? And now all of a sudden I say to myself, no, 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 you're not gonna buy that. No, 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 you don't need that, but it's nice. No, you don't need it. So I have this constant fight with myself, yeah? And little by little, I'm getting myself out of the consumption. And I really try to buy, not always, sometimes I buy a piece of clothes that I don't really need, but I like. Uh, but in most cases, I control how much I buy. I control how much waste I produce. You know, I buy the food and I eat the food. I don't throw it away. I, I use uh, different pieces in a different types of food that at the end, there is hardly no garbage. I started to go to, to the stores where I can, uh, I don't uh, buy packaged food where it's not necessary, like on the markets or in small eco stores when they already have refusal. And it's great because it's much less packaging. My garbage can doesn't get filled for a week. Yeah. Uh, so these are little steps that I can do. Recycle. 
I mean, if you saw if you saw my kitchen, if you were in my kitchen, you would see that uh, there are five boxes in the kitchen, and each box is for different type of recycling. And even though I'm not sure, once I recycle in different recycling facilities, that they really use that uh, as a recycling material, as a raw material for something else, we are in the process of changing our culture. Eventually, this will come together. Yeah. Eventually, we will recycle enough that the businesses will pick up, like they do it already for glass, for paper, for some type of plastic, um, but not for everything. Yeah. But still, I recycle faithfully just to make sure that my uh, life uh, habits and behavior is changing. So these are small steps. You don't need, you know, no, no additional investments for that. Uh, actually, you save money. I remember the arguments I had with my friends when a couple of years ago they did the analysis of all stores, comparing the prices for different products in different hypermarkets, supermarkets, uh, different brands. Yeah, and I said, guys. I decided to buy food only on farmer's market and in small bio store that I have around the corner. Oh, but that is so much more expensive. Yeah, it's easy for you to say. I said, okay, the argument is right that it's more expensive, but I use less money because we eat by far less food that is organically rich than we did before. So I, would, I noticed that uh, I'm buying like between 15 and 20% less goods that I used to buy. So even though that that was much more expensive at the end, we were profiting not only through just eating less, but through being more healthy, being full of energy, being able to you know, engage. So green today means business. Green is, should not be expensive. Green means efficiency. Green means better care, less consumption. Um, and then eventually repair. We completely excluded from our Western society the repair phase. You cannot repair anything anymore. You know, I remember we had washing machine for 16 years and there was every year there was uh, somebody who came just to check it out and maybe cleaned it and replaced some of the parts. But now you cannot go beyond seven, maximum 10 years and things run out. So, um, yeah, we can do a lot. And no one needed for that. So go ahead. And in whichever shape, way, shape or form we are, whatever we're doing in, uh, whether we're doing a commercial activity or we're doing just the other things that we do, it's, it's possible absolutely in every part of life in that sense. Um, I will share one story with you from India. Yeah, I like India a lot. And I, I spent, my sister uh, was sent there as a uh, rep and I went to visit her once, but then I traveled also by myself. And um, I remember once uh, I had with me my kids as well. So we took that little white taxi that it's in Bangalore. And I said, okay, let's, let's just go around a little bit and get the, uh, a sense of the city and everything. And uh, I had little sandwiches with me. So the kids, you know, small kids need to eat all the time. Uh, and once I unwrapped them, the driver said, now throw it out. I said, no, I had a little bag, like good European, and I put every, no, throw it out, I said. And we had a serious argument, it wasn't a joke. Uh, he said, you're depriving our people from making some money. It was a hard lesson, but uh, in a way you, had this you have this recycling process in place, but instead of throwing out maybe, and I know that in some places you are really well organized already by now, but if there are people to, that uh, need to make money out of the uh, wrappings and um, uh, sort of garbage, uh, then this could still be supported. That's what my point is, but in a slightly different way. Yeah, in a slightly different way. And that's where social innovation can come in. That's where can all of you engage and try to find the new ways of organizing um, the processes without challenging the social uh, frameworks. Yep, absolutely. 
uh, just just changing uh, what we're talking about, Violetta, a bit. Um, Leonard on in chat uh, has has uh, zeroed in on the word ikigai that you've written in in the being circle, right? And I've I've read the others as well. Um, and his question is really this: that there is there is so much chaos in our world and our lives today, uh, bits and pieces of which we've spoken about. But in within all of this chaos, how do you actually achieve a state of happiness uh, while knowing that you are in in this state of chaos? And uh, of all what you've said so uh, far, well, I learned it. that from Indians, so from your country. Whenever there is chaos around you, find peace in yourself. If it's too peaceful around you, make chaos from your inner 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 strength. So I follow that. So. I'm sending you your advice back to you. So when there is a chaos around you, find peace in yourself and in what you do and the, the benefits you want to bring to the society. You know, don't even look at the chaos. The chaos will exist if you uh, want it or not. So, but by bringing this peaceful energy from inside out, little by little, the world around you will become more peaceful. And imagine that 1 billion people does that. They do that. 1 billion people, you're more than that. You're already 1.2, right? Uh, and imagine that you all do that. You remember when we were playing those little first games, which were uh, little bombs that you had to uncover in a grid. Yeah, and if you hit the right uh, square, an open field will appear. If you happen to hit the bomb, then it, everything would explode and, 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 uh, and the game would be over. But the beauty in life is that uh, you can never be really defeated because every time uh, you hit a bomb like that, um, that is the best lesson you can ever learn. I mean, I had a, one very, very negative experience when I understood the hardcore neoliberalistic uh, logic, but I got out so much stronger and with such a big smile because I learned and everybody I meet today on the street that were part of that uh, sort of fraud almost, uh, I'm the one who's smiling. No, and that, that made me stronger. So even if you go through negative experiences, don't don't shy from them. Take them as you know. It's gonna hurt maybe a couple of days, maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months. But later on, you will be much stronger, much stronger. I just acknowledge all the learnings. See how, how can you improve, um, and see you know, what are the failures of the system, and just move on. Understood. Rishabh, you had your hand up. Uh, yep. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us today. Uh, so uh, I, I don't have a question as such, but uh, just a second. Yeah. I don't have a question as such, but just uh, just wanted to say that, you know, uh, like this, the framework that you've built, it's like really amazing and uh, how you spoke about the collective consciousness and uh, you know uh, we, like all of us we actually you know during the pandemic as the pandemic came in uh, like you said you know how things do happen you know uh, when you look at things backwards you know things start it starts to connect and you need that you know that spiritual aspect uh, you need to understand that spiritual aspect and uh, what i wanted to say is that you know in this period of pandemic you know the collective consciousness of feeling you know scared of you know feeling uh, of you know of people coming together you know talking about how we are all in this together uh, all these things you know made me you know i used to like just think about this this thing that how you know what like right now i see uh, the eco civilization it's like an idea for the future and you know on the similar lines i always wondered like if you know like the concept of religion is that, you know, a person, what he does is like, you know, he needs to be a bit spiritual, you know, from the truest sense. And, you know, he needs to, you know, attach his identity to the religion and, you know, put faith and 
immense like they basically you know put immense faith in it so similarly like uh the, you know a religion based on human values on humanity and you know caring about earth which is kind of like you know parallel to what i mean talking about creating a religion is more controversial and you know it is uh i mean what you your uh, uh, framework is it's much more practical in a real sense since you know you even have uh, the exposure of Uh, like you know you have uh, achieved so much in life and you know you've seen things in real life how things work but what i'm saying is that you know as the collective consciousness expands and i actually i mean i might be wrong but i i feel that you know people are getting more and more aware about themselves about you know what uh, i mean maybe it's uh, just this generation or it's a, a good time that you know we could say but you know uh, Uh, the the fact that you know as this collective consciousness expands do you think that you know uh, the world could come together if you know there's a religion where people actually you know put faith in humanity and uh, i mean of course like most religions have past like they have a you know history they have epics they have a lot of case studies uh, not case studies but uh, you know stories and you know things that we haven't seen but you know people have been believing in them for a long time similarly like uh, you know how we can deal with the real world situation and how if we imbibe values which are getting more and more you know clear to a lot of people uh, nowadays do you think that you know it's going to be uh, you know somewhere down the line like in the one of this i mean it could be kind of a solution where just like you know uh, you know we like The, the religion just talks about values you know it, it doesn't have to be uh, you know uh, i mean mostly about you know how a particular person should have a mindset and you know he should uh, you know think about when it comes to other like how you know like ideas of compassion and empathy and you know taking other people Uh, on the basis of like you know how they can be our comrades and we are all like you know connected in some way and you know even the science like you mentioned the quantum physics even like the science is advancing and you know a lot of researches are being done how these things that we have spoken about since ages they they are actually true i mean they are still like in in progress but uh, as we progress like the fact that you know we all are connected in a very unique way uh, do you think like we can all connect on an idea of a religion which is of course like you know uh, not something which is supposed to be forced on upon but i mean if you know we understand the idea of self and you know if we integrate the values of uh, being spiritual in the truest sense which is just you know getting just to do have a good relationship with yourself and you know to know yourself better and better in I mean, it's a journey, lifelong journey, I believe. So, just want to know, like, you know, just want to hear some ideas uh, on this from you. Mm. Well, you have opened uh, up a very, very important point. Um, for me, spirituality is is uh, universe of uh, everything in a way. then you have religious that found um, it's within the spirituality realm um, a bit more structural way of dealing with spirituality and then you have a church which is an institution and we always have to understand that these are three different entities um, connected but still different Uh, they reflect uh, the nature of the systems if you look at the old civilizations they all were based on a very strong collective um, individual was always serving only collective everything was part of the collective then we started to resist that um, especially when in europe for example i don't know exactly how it was in india but in europe we had this strong uh, militant push by the church who claimed to be representative of religion um, of a certain type of religion under the umbrella of spirituality um, 
they became very violent and we had this period of inquisition in Europe. Yeah. But out of that, uh, the individualism was born because there was such a strong push against collective, anything that was um, part of the collective. That's how then capitalism started to evolve and especially liberal capitalism where they said, uh, no state, no uh, structures, we are responsible for our own lives if we go into an extreme of interpretation. But what we are realizing now is that this completely individualistic approach is not delivering a stable sort of uh, a stable uh, future. So now we're in a process again of integration but with the rich experiences of collective and individualism. Because it's a natural process and the way how systems behave, it's embedded uh, behavior. Um, I do hope that uh, we will be able to acknowledge human uh, being on all six levels uh, of uh, his or her existence, which is intellectual, physical, emotional, spiritual, social, and energy level. So once you have this imbalance, whew, then you are uh, fully manifesting your essence. Uh, one prevailing over the other, uh, you have challenges on the edge. And the whole life journey is finding that balance. And some people uh, need institutional support for that. Some people need social support for that. Some people um, are looking at, uh, looking for this balance by themselves. Um, so as long as we keep an open-minded approach that there are many ways that lead to Rome, the societies will evolve and will find its balance um, with the undercurrent of system behavior. The challenge appears when one group, one individual, one country suddenly feels that they are the one to set the rules. Then we have a problem. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, as we mature as uh, humans, we will be able to acknowledge the differences better we will be able to understand that there are certain uh, levels of human uh, humans that are private, individual, and there are certain levels that we engage over with other people in order to balance the society as well. Yeah, um, you know, one, uh, one thing and one thought I'm just sending out to everybody else uh, out here. One of the things uh, I picked up on when, when Violetta was speaking and something that I think we've spoken about in, in, uh, in different contexts as well, is the question whether capitalism is actually the antithesis to religion, right? And if that's actually a kind of a uh, meta that we need to be um, aware of, acknowledge, and then uh, interpret in whatever ways that we need to thereafter. But again, that's just, that's just something for you, all of you to think about uh, at, mm -hmm. at some point in time. Um, Ayush, you, you've got a question, so why, why, why don't you uh, unmute yourself? I cannot hear. You'll have to be a little louder, right? I think, uh, I think but the crux of crux really of what he was talking about is that, is it even possible to have a shared vision? Um, and the question actually that I, I wanted to ask you is that, is a collective consciousness actually possible? Because um, there is so much diversity on our planet. There is so much diversity within a country, within a state, within a region of the country, within even like one household, perhaps, right? And I'm, I'm actually paraphrasing what he actually ended up saying, but, uh, but because we are not taught as, as humans um, to, to think as, look at things as being collective, but we are actually shown the differences right from the start that you are X, you are Y. Those are the things that you're taught in the first place. You're, you're a Slovenian, you're um, a Belarusian, so on and so forth, right? Those are the kind of things that we are taught. And that's just, of course, at a, at a national, a national level, it's also the same at a, at a family level and so on and so forth. 
uh, in that entire construct, how is it really possible to have a shared vision and a shared consciousness? That was part one. And the second one also, I'll paraphrase Ayush. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to probably uh, move it around a bit. But just in terms of also when you're looking at a balance with respect to uh, production, with respect to commerce and whatever else, there is always a give and take. There's always that to, for one to give, someone uh, will be taking. So there will always be that little bit of an imbalance that will end up getting created. So, um, which is also not really very ideal, right? At the end of the day. So how do you look at both these aspects? One that we, we're all different. Uh, so how do we have a shared consciousness? And second, that even if we have to progress, there will be someone progressing in lieu of somebody else in that mm. sense. Mm. Mm. Poof, very tough questions, guys. Uh, but um, of course, I will try to be very smart and I will try to answer them. I should have just said maybe we should skip them. But look, you challenged me, I challenge you back. Um, collective consciousness I don't think it has any ownership. Collective consciousness is. And then we all take different views and get different wisdom out of this collective consciousness. So uh, there is no need of owning it. There is no need of unifying its understanding, but it's there. Yeah. Um, so uh, I hope that that uh, answers uh, this first challenge. Uh, we do not need to all understand collective consciousness in the same manner because we don't have the same need uh, to, 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 to take the same type of knowledge out of this collective. But we all contribute to it. So it's there. It's like imagine it as a big white uh, world wide web. Uh, and uh, okay, now I'm gonna, before I answer this, I, I have a question for you. How old is the concept of internet? Anybody dares to answer? I'm not going to answer someone else. Okay, I'm not going to waste too much time, but I will sell you back your own idea. It's about, it goes back about 3,500 years before uh, Christ. And it originates from India. Because you guys are really smart and you change the leading gods time to time. Yeah? So nobody can prevail. And when God Indra was appointed to the uh, leading God, and pardon my expression, I don't mean to be disrespectful of any uh, in any way. I'm just trying to tell a story which uh, really inspired me. So when God Indra became the, uh, uh, the, the leading God, uh, he didn't know much about the world because he was the God of underworld. Uh, so uh, he asked his servants, to create a network, uh, a, a fisherman's network around the world and put in every crossing, in every, in every knot, a diamond. So no matter where the God was, he could always see what's happening around the world. And this is the basic concept that internet is using. No matter where you are, you can always get the information from all over the world as long as uh, the information is on a computer that is connected to the net. Uh, where I'm getting that is that all this knowledge that we're accumulating is not always good, but it is our experience. It is our collective. Even though it's bad, some it's harmful, but it is part of our collective. Our collective is not only good. Yeah. And we take out whatever we want, whatever we need, whatever we trust that it is relevant or uh, true, reliable. So and very comparable. And I think that the reason why we created physical World Wide Web is that we finally realize who we are and how much we know and how much information there is out there, how much knowledge is out there. Uh, and eventually we probably won't need it anymore. So that's my relationship with the collective. However, I know that we can develop shared vision. That's different. That it's something uh, under which uh, umbrella we engage with each other. And if nothing 
else, climate change is this umbrella today. Uh, currently, COVID-19 is such an umbrella where we everybody's trying to engage one way or the other, not always with the most positive or most uh, noble manners, um, uh, motivations, but we are engaging uh, like we have learned in the past to engage over trade and economy. And uh, probably today, if anything, uh, market and creation of uh, global values through markets and trade is something that brings this world together. And I imagine that we add to this uh, shared vision and, and, and relationships transparency, only one dimension, which doesn't cost anything. It's just uh, behavior. Uh, we could have a very different world out there. So uh, shared values, shared visions are necessary for the groups to engage uh, and uh, to, to sort of uh, be able, yeah, to cooperate and co-create together with others. And we are doing it. This is a constant effort. Whenever we have a project, the first thing we try to do is define the purpose. Why? Yeah? You know, three questions. Why, how, and what are the basic three questions of innovation ecosystems? So purpose first. Then how are we going to go about? And then what are we going to deliver? Uh, so that's my take on the first question. The second question is, we are, we humans uh, have 100% talents, each of us, but we are not perfect. Yeah, we have our uh, discrepancies. We have at the edge, there is always uh, complexity that we it's uh, related to us humans always uh, allows us to fail always allows us to this imperfection makes us unpredictable and that's the beauty of humans it's we are unpredictable we are curious we react uh, based on the um, on the context and on 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 the environment in which we are in and that's the beauty, but brings also negative things. So nothing will be ever perfect. It will always be a journey towards something that we would like to achieve. And this journey itself uh, gets us closer and closer to our balanced state. But here, I'm uh, not trying to uh, seduce myself with uh, a journey that will make me perfect, but just a journey that will make me uh, better and more balanced and more perceptive for what you know, everything that is going on around us. And it's um, and like what you said earlier as well, Violetta, it's, 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 uh, that's how really all of it will add up. And when you were speaking to Ohm as well, um, I think there's bits and pieces from there also which become very relevant is because you look at everything around you and as you keep working on those little pieces and the, those little bits is when that balance will actually end up coming and it will take time. It's it's not a, uh, there's no magic wand in that sense. There's no stamp. Yes. Uh, it will take time, but it does require all of us to consistently be at it. And that's really what the... Mm -hmm. Uh, but be comfortable with your imperfection because many times we are causing too many problems to ourselves because uh, we think we are not worth it. We think we are not good enough. We think that we are, and many um, times society puts that pressure on that, but don't, don't fall for it. You know, be comfortable. I have many little imperfections, many. And uh, I laugh at them now. I mean, I can expect them. There comes a situation and I say, oh, be careful. Uh, but uh, I'm becoming comfortable with that uh, because that's me too. That's what makes me, me, yeah? Uh, just try 
you know, as much as you can be truthful uh, and sincere and try to always do good. But these imperfections are part of our collective picture as well. And that's where tolerance comes in. And that is the difference being in love and love somebody, you know? Being in love, all is perfect. And then if you met the right person, then you will start loving that person. And this imperfection is part of it. And you will love the imperfection. That's when you know that you love somebody. You know, like mother loves, in most cases, their kids or parents love their kids with all the imperfections. Or uh, you love your partner with all the imperfections because as soon as you don't like their imperfections anymore, you're not together anymore. That's not love anymore. And you have to start with yourself. That's that's just absolutely you love yourself with all imperfections. Yeah. All right, uh, Shivali, you had something that you wanted to ask Violetta. Um, yes. Uh, hi. Um, so, um, since you mentioned that you have been a sportswoman, um, I just wanted to talk to you about, um, and this is something that I've been thinking about, and I wanted to take this up. Um, for the discussion that will be happening on the 4th or the 5th of November for my R. And um, that is essentially the fact that we all know that there are um, um, wage gaps in the sports sector, gender related. And um, I was thinking about the need for um, more like a top, a top down international reform to address the gender wage gap in sports. Mm -hmm. Um, because I realized that um, the highest standard of sports in any country is essentially the Olympics or, or the international level. And um, if it, it might be more effective if there are international standards or international um, guidelines for establishing, um, you know, certain policies um, related to eradicating gender wage gaps. And if there is a higher authority that can essentially um you know kind of help in uh, getting these things in place in each country maybe that would um, really help in supplementing the grassroots level um efforts that have been going on in each country to actually reduce the gaps so what is your take on that well gender gap uh, is something that is very typical uh, in the civilization that we are currently engaged in for the civilization we're currently engaged in. Um, I'm not going to go back when the, this started and why, because that's a lot of philosophical discussions around that. But uh, the fact is that today's society is invited on all levels and everywhere uh, to start functioning with full lungs. There is 51% of women in this world and uh, 49% of men. So uh, if we want to have a sustainable and uh, uh, inclusive, stable society, we need to engage the entire society in the process. So that's how the whole thing started. Uh, you cannot fully breathe with half of your lungs. Yeah. So. Uh, while I'm saying that, there is huge challenge, cultural, religious, uh, political, social, whichever, name it. And, uh, but what is really encouraging is that in all segments of our society, this is becoming a topic, not for women to overpower men, which would be a completely wrong uh, move, but to find the balance of mutual respect and of mutual understanding that we both need each other in order to find a way forward into more balanced society. So uh, as a commissioner, and even before in life, but not with such a great results, but as a commissioner, uh, uh, all my five years, we've been, um, working a lot on bringing gender balance in transport. Currently in Europe, you have 5% of female pilots, 3% of uh, 
of uh, seafarers and 2% of train drivers. Uh, all the rest are men. And these are well-paid jobs in transport. So uh, we started to bring stakeholders together and we signed a social code where all stakeholders on all levels of the businesses made a commitment of narrowing the gap uh, in, uh, in their portfolios. And this is still ongoing. But through that process, we realized that it's more than just giving a woman an opportunity to get uh, a job. There is a lot of infrastructure issues. For example, uh, in order to have female drivers, you needed to have all of a sudden female toilet facilities, showers. Yeah? Uh, and that was the reason why women did not en uh, enter the profession. But on the other side, uh, there was an encouraging, really encouraging story that pushed the whole uh, process uh, into emotion when Volvo decided to start hiring um, female drivers, learning that female drivers use less gas, have less accidents, um, have a much better relationship with the clients. Once men learned that, they started to maintain their trucks better, they were causing less accidents, they were using less fuel, and they started to talk to customers. So we learned from each other. So we balanced that and the employer realized that if they remove women out of this model, they will again lose that. So it was business, beneficial for business to have a gender balanced teams because they were bringing different qualities into place. That was a really, really good example of that. Um, so, and many, many stories started to emerge. So we started to conduct yearly conferences where at the beginning, they were only female. Next year, a couple of HR managers came and uh, uh, the group started to grow from 40 to 120. And the last year was uh, 160 people where 40% were men. Because all of a sudden they understood, especially representatives of minorities or uh, with uh, um, disability groups or um, all those that felt pushed aside, they started to come on board and we decided not to go anymore for only female, but for gender balanced, equal opportunity environment. So the whole thing evolved. I was really happy at the end. Um, another example is when uh, President Juncker uh, came ahead, the first college, our first meeting with commissioners, he said, today we have only 23% of female leaders within EU institutions on the top management positions. When we leave, we want to leave the commission with 42% of female leaders. It was like almost a bomb. No, it's impossible. No, we cannot do that. Five years later, 43.6%. And all the only politics that we all had to follow, including commissioners and our deputies and our uh, director generals, they had to follow uh, the rule, invite female candidates to apply because they did not apply because they thought everything's been agreed among men. So apply was the first rule. The second, among two equal, choose a woman. If they're not two equal, choose, the, choose a man. Don't hold back. Don't look for the better woman. But if you have to equal, give a woman opportunity, an opportunity. 43.6 in five years time, without any revolution. It can be done. So look for these examples, all, at least in Europe, pretty much all, even uh, institutions have to have now a gender balance uh, policy, uh, but we are not there yet. There is nothing ideal. Uh, top management positions are still mostly held by men. There is still a, a pay gap, but things are improving and that we, 
have to support and continue. Uh, you have formula either also with quotas, which in sport, of course, doesn't apply, but in uh, some other areas, uh, quotas prove to be very good temporary solution uh, where you can push for a change uh, much faster. That Scandinavia countries really show the way. And nobody thinks anymore, is it a woman or a man a politician that is on a ballot? They are focusing on what they can offer. Uh, for example, in my country, it's still prejudice. You know, it's still men are much easier. It's much easier to elect a man than a woman. But we are learning. We're trying to engage and try to see uh, where are really what are really the reasons. Address them. It's not this is not an easy task. It's not a trivial task. It has a lot to do with cultural frameworks, and with. Uh, but look at FIA, Federal Automotive uh, Federation. Uh, they have now girls on tracks, uh, women, they're training young female drivers to, to be able to race in Formula One. Um, you know, they have now equal uh, training camps uh, for women and for men, for boys and for girls. So sports, sport is moving forward. Once the, you know, automotive sport opens and if uh, Jean Todt was able to do that, then any sport can do that, I think. Yeah, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, with this example that you gave of, of the European Commission as well, it's, if that mandate comes from the top down, then it's really about that in their, its implementation and, and, and wonderful things can happen if uh, yeah. everyone is mandated to move in a particular direction, which they otherwise would not think possible, right? And that's, yeah. that's the real, real, real bit. It takes one person to then effectively make that change and then everybody else uh, sees the benefit of it also. Um, Indeed. I, I know, Violetta, we had you for two hours. We are above that. <laughs> um, you have a few more minutes uh, to, to chat with us, or are we getting a bit late? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, good, because I've got a question from Ayush again as well. Um, he's, he's come on from another device, and he wanted to ask a, another question to you. Ayush, so why don't you try? Uh, am I hopefully audible? Uh, <laughs> very light. <laughs> New device, but still very light. Okay, so I'm, I'm really trying hard to hear you. So why don't you go ahead and I'll relay it to Violetta. Yeah, try, please. Okay. So, so let me just see. Wait a minute. Any better? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, so the basic question that I have is that over the time, so as I've been thinking for a lot of years, and one thing that has bugged me is the gap that is between the ones who are in need of something and the ones who are capable of giving, but due to either one of the other reasons, they are just not able to give, be it because of the reasons that they don't find an outlet or a window to do so, be it because of the reasons that there is this pseudo, uh, you know, uh, feeling of self-satisfaction that even if I give, there's no change that is going to be made. Like the dirt <laughs> of that very, uh, satisfaction that you see within yourself and right in front of your eyes that I've done so and so and there is so and so change that is visible to me that particular satisfaction which I've seen a lot of times is missing leads people to believe that uh, fine I mean even if I do a person or even if I do a hundred what bigger difference could it make so is, is there a possible way to address this gap and while I also think of doing the same, what I think of is, is, is it a way that you can facilitate these connections where the ones who are in need are given what they need at their particular point in time and not at when we feel that, yeah, now it's time that we are free and we should not, yeah. not, not giving it at the time when they need it, but at our own will. Got it. Own Violetta, did you, did you get it or should I repeat? Please. Okay. I will no. So, so basically, what she's what he's saying is actually something that that keeps uh, worrying me as well, right? Uh, what he's asking is that in our world there will always be uh, at least two sets of people: those who need and require, right? Who may be underprivileged in that sense, or who may not have uh, all uh, the necessities that others possess, and so on and so forth. So there will be that set, and then there'll be a set of people who are in a position to give. 
right? Because who either have excesses or who have uh, the ability to help those who actually are in need and so on and so forth. But invariably, that gap between the two remains unfulfilled, right? Because those who can give either don't know how to give, either they, they feel that, uh, you know, what's the point of my giving, someone else may be giving, right? Or they feel that, uh, you know, as one of the things he mentioned is that sometimes if we do things directly, we get more satisfaction than if we do it via somebody else. Like, you know, like uh, uh, donating to an NGO, for example, or giving books out who you don't really know. Uh, this sense of satisfaction that one, one gets, right? Um, and when then you feel, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with my money if I give it to somebody. I don't know the effort I'm making today. Uh, will it actually help somebody or not? So I'd rather not. And then they just steer clear of actually helping. Uh, whereas I, mean, I personally believe that if, every, if this gap, and I think that's what I was saying as well, is that this gap between those who require and who need that assistance and then help and so on and so forth, uh, and those who are in a position to give but do not because of all of these various reasons that he spoke about, is there a way in which we can actually try and find a way to bridge this gap? And how do we actually go about to do that? Because if we do that, uh, there is so much in this world that can get solved. Oof. Um, all I can do is I can share my own frustrations with you because this is an area where we sooner or later find ourselves in. Um, well, if you check my introduction at the beginning, you will see that I wrote, I'm a socialist in my heart, I'm innovator in my mind, and I'm a globalist, green globalist in my uh, spirit. Uh, so I do donate, something, sometimes directly, sometimes through organizations. But I always feel very bad when I donate. Because I don't think that, uh, I think we are developed enough as a society that this should not be necessary. That we could organize our society in a way that nobody is hungry, nobody uh, is uh, without the basic needs. Uh, I'm not really yet clear on the concept of basic income. Um, that I'm not convinced yet, but. I think that we uh, should not uh, move away from the responsibility of a state or a system and that the state should be the one who provides the basic conditions uh, for living for every single citizen. Speaking of India, I can imagine that that could be a challenge, but at the same time, you have the largest number of billionaires in the world. Um, and uh, we saw that now in COVID crisis, all of a sudden money is coming from everywhere. Where was that money before? When we wanted to have it for social services, when we wanted to have it for investment in infrastructure for the benefits of all people. So here is where I'm a socialist. I think we should create societies where basic needs are met. Um, and uh, we have sort of a decent living uh, starting point for everyone. Uh, whew, how long it will take to get there, uh, it's a good question. Uh, probably as long as it takes to get to eco-civilization. Um, if we pull things together, things could be done uh, in our lifetime, but um, realistically, probably about two to three hundred years. Um, as I said, when I donate and I call people and I do help where I can, I always say, look, I'm doing it because you're giving it to you because you're doing a great job. But I have to tell you that I don't like that. Uh, I don't like to feel superior. And, uh, you know, because through giving donations for somebody to have a basic life conditions, feels actually quite sad. Um, but I do it, I do it. Uh, and um, I, I think philanthropy, it's really the decadency of modern world. You know, if you have too much money, why do you take it in the first place? Why don't you allow that money to circulate, give people better jobs, give people better salaries and they will be able to provide uh, for themselves? Why do you want to first accumulate and then give back as a you know, charity? 
I, I think that's that's a decadency at its best. But that's where we are uh, with this individualistic uh, swing uh, of the of the of the uh, population or development of human being, and uh, slowly but surely we will get out of this because it will not feed us anymore. It will not serve the purpose anymore. Uh, we can speed up this process by just being more socially aware and vote for good infrastructure, vote for good public schools, vote for good public health. For example, Sweden is a great example. They were among the first who privatized the health system. Now they're among the first who are uh, again, uh, moving away from privatized uh, public health system model because it's not working. Because when it's privatized, you don't have this social um, commitment. You take care of yourself, you're private. You take care of your private business. Um, and too many people are left behind. So there are certain things that we need to have um, as a country level obligation uh, and they have nothing to do with capitalism or socialism but they have to do with the decency of being human i'm a bit radical on that but you well, ask me i openly share no, absolutely we let with the problem you know the trouble really is and that's where your your frustrations come in as well and that's where all of us get frustrated at some level or the other um, is you know but one I, thing one thing I learned if I may admit one thing I learned if I give something I give and I don't ask for anything back yeah, yeah. so just do your homework if you don't trust organization yeah. don't give it to organization if you don't like a person don't give it to a person but once you give it you give something give it with love and really with a positive vibe and hopefully it will create some good no, no, absolutely, Violetta. No, just a just a frustration that I wanted to to add on to as well is you know I was speaking to a, a fairly decently world renowned economist a while back, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to name uh, name him, but uh, what he's what he said to me was that look, Ramit, if um, if everyone was a billionaire in our world, then being a billionaire would be being poor, right? Mm -hmm. And which is when I was talking about this whole idea, exactly what you said, you know, the, why is it that we as, as governments, as society, as the world cannot provide for everybody? We sh that is, shouldn't that be our primary objective? And his response to me was effectively quite cryptic in this sense, but, but saying the fact that if everyone was a billionaire, then everyone would be poor. And I, I just couldn't fathom it, right? And I, I disagree. I completely that, disagree. No matter, even if he won the Nobel Prize, I disagree with that person. Uh, because I see it uh, in Europe uh, emerging under a completely different umbrella. Uh, why do we have trillions and trillions of whatever, euros, dollars, uh, ones, uh, in offshore businesses? This is direct steal from the real economy. You know, it's very simple. Get this money back into circulation. Why do we allow that? That's, I'm not going to go too far on this one, maybe in, in another session, but uh, it's obvious it's in front of us. Yeah, it is. And I, you know, I, I say it well, and maybe a bit provocative, uh, but one of the things that the one, of, one of our colleagues was talking about was the Cyprus investment treaty and uh, other such things as well that, that are going on right now in 2020 as we sit, um, which just makes it very, it, it makes it very confusing to try and figure out that, you know, on one hand, we're talking about things like the environment and things like, things like the COVID is bringing us together. And on the other hand, we're looking at, again, more ways of figuring out where is the next uh, place where we can do the kind of financial things that we were doing in other places. I mean, it, okay. Blows my mind, frankly. Um, exactly, exactly. So it is uh, this to go back uh, to us individuals. We need to clear the path to the truthfulness and to the um, to the clear, clean energy 
and then this will not be necessary. We won't have a need anymore. I mean, people who accumulate money, for Christ's sake, they must be very sad. They must be very afraid. They must be uh, very lonely, you know? Mm. Because that's what how they feel their void with yeah. huge accumulation, being number one in the world in wealth. <laughs> really? Is that what you want? Be my guest. Two more, two more things, Violetta, and then we'll let you go. I know we've taken a lot of your time. First of all, I've been, because you've got the slide on since, uh, for a very long time, and I keep staring at what's right in the top center. where you <laughs> Watch the array. Exactly. But I believe what you've written there is stay young. Is that, that's how it's translated, right? It's stay uh, healthy, uh, young, and strong. Yeah. yeah it's definitely. an old greetings from my uh, part of the world. Uh, old, old uh, ways used to greet each other with Ostiere. Ostiere, all right. Understood. Or Oi, Oi in a short. Ah, nice, nice, nice. Fantastic. Because it's everyone who is who is here, I think um, good, good message for them. Just and I wanted to get that translated. Uh, yeah. but, but again, so finally, that was just, I'm sorry, that was something that was. Yeah. No, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> moving on. Um, you, we, this is the fair project, Violetta. We, we, uh, the whole idea from our perspective is about um, how fairness is one of the ways in which we can we can achieve all of this and achieve everything that you're talking about as well. Because you came back, came from the self, right? And in the self, if we can develop that entire uh, thought process of fairness in whatever we do, we'll recognize that it's not really about right or wrong. It's about about fairness, right? And it's about at that point of time, how are you making sure you're creating that balance? which you were talking about quite a bit as well. But, but tell me from your perspective, right? Before, before we let you go, what do you really think fairness is and what does is, what is the word fair and fairness mean, mean to you in all of that you've talk, spoken about right now or, or uh, otherwise as well? I will go back to what I said a uh, long time ago. I'd like us to go back and always do what we feel is right. We, individual, what it feels here. And it's not about right and wrong. It is what it feels to be right for the moment. What it feels that uh, is in balance with the vibes that are around us. Is uh, in balance with the calling and the things we are asked to do. Sincerely, uh, I had to. I had a period about five years when I was very much focusing on two negative behaviors that I had. One was judgment, and the second one was expectations. I found that these two uh, characteristics are the most damaging for my full engagement with people and full participation in, 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 in uh, team, teams or anywhere in public. Uh, it was quite hard because then you realize how we constantly judge and constantly expect, especially from other people things we cannot do ourselves. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm completely out of it, of course, but it is so liberating not to be trapped in this anymore. Um, so instead of talking about the general terms, I would invite us again to go back, look at yourself and uh, just enjoy in development of this incredible creature that you are. Uh, and through that, you will call and engage uh, with people who share your current state of mind uh, and if you don't like it move on invest even more in yourself i i will share something very intimate when i was a commissioner in brussels and i was late evening in my office just packing to go home i often ask myself is that what i need to evolve further you know is that what i need um, and the answer was yes yes Exactly. Okay. And with a smile, I went into another day. Uh, 
it's that what I'd like to leave you uh, with is this power of your own development uh, and just seize the moments that are around you uh, and don't judge them by the amount of money you can make with the type of important people or not important people you're engaged with. Just go with what feels right. That's probably the simplest story of my life. I'm just trying to do what I feel is right all the time. Thank you so much, Violetta. Thank you so much for that. I think um, for this entire two and a half hours that you've been with us, really. Um, a lot Thank of, you for the opportunity. I'll, I'll be honest with you. There'll be a lot of things that I'll have to go back to. So I'm going to rewatch this entire recording because you know there were so many times when you were talking about something and my mind just remained there because I wanted to start thinking about it and you had moved on, right? <laughs> um, there's so many of those nuggets in these two and a half hours that um, I think just, just watching this again is going to be a delight. So thank you so much for this, Violetta. Thank you for all your time. Uh, to everyone else who's been around as well, those of you who unfortunately had to drop out as well, because uh, I, I know with school and colleges and work, uh, the way things are, but thank you so much for all of this. And uh, we'll let her, hopefully we will, we will speak again soon at some point in time, and there will be an opportunity where we will interact with you again. Thanks for this opportunity. I don't think I've ever spoken so openly in any within any other crowd. Uh, so uh, thanks for all your questions and um, really going deeply into my own uh, relationship with life and everything is around me. But um, I do believe that that's the way to go and move forward. So if I encourage anyone uh, to, to, to be uh, more open, to be more frank, but with an honest uh, heart, um, then um, I'm going to be very uh, happy and uh, I'm really humbled in front of you. So um, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, you, you are really privileged to have a setup like this and to be part of a process like this. So Ramit, I bow to you and um, to your vision uh, and capacity to create a space where these young people can have an opportunity to expand their mind. And as uh, Indian gurus are teaching us, expand your mind to create space that your creativity can flourish. So keep expanding your mind and create your spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Violetta. Thank you for that. And to everyone else. Thanks a lot, guys. All the best in your life. Thank you. Oi. Oh, wait to you too.